from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm delighted to be introducing our final author of the day here in the Poetry and Prose tent, Laura Kaziski. I first encountered Laura Kaziski's work with the release of her newest collection of poems and fell instantly in love. And there is so much to love of Laura Kaziski's writing. She is a prolific writer of both poetry and prose, the author of 16 books, eight novels, and eight books of poems. Her most recent publications include a poetry collection, Space in Chains, and a novel, The Raising. She has a 17th book, a collection of short stories titled If a Stranger Approaches, forthcoming in fall of 2012. She is a recipient of numerous honors, including the 2012 National Book Circle Critic Award for her Space in Chains. She has been awarded fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment of the Arts, and two of her novels, The Life Before Her Eyes and Suspicious River, have been turned into films. Within her poetry, Kaziski is able to weave masterfully between the myth and the minutia of the struggles of everyday life, her poems delve into the heart of domesticity and complicate our notions of what it means to live inside of constructed roles like mother, daughter, and wife. New York Times critic and Harvard professor of English Stephen Burt has championed Kaziski and said of her work, no other poet has tried so hard to cut through American suburban illusion while respecting the lies that it nurtures or saves. Kaziski serves as the Alan Seeger Collegiate Press Professor of English Language and Literature at the University of Michigan and lives in nearby Chelsea, Michigan with her husband, son, and daughter. Please join me in welcoming Laura Kaziski to the stage. Thank you so much for being here and it's a uh, kind of a dream come true to come to a, a festival like this where there are so many fellow readers and writers milling about and um, feeling feeling uh, the love. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just thrilled and honored to be here. And thank you, Caitlin, so much for the introduction. It's lovely. I'm going to start with a poem uh, that I wrote quite a long time ago. It's uh, about my son. and. When he was very young, I used to read, always start the readings with this poem as a kind of charm, hoping that if he wasn't in the audience, that all was well with him. When I first had a son, I was suddenly um, introduced to this whole world of products that had never occurred to me before, you know, all kinds of things to keep the baby clean or um, subdued or <laughs> uh, distracted. and. Um, uh, so many of them had, as a disclaimer on them, do not leave baby unattended. And, uh, it, you know, once you've had a baby, uh, f at least for me, it never crossed my mind that I would really be able to leave him unattended, although, you know, I used to wish I could. And, um, but this was on, this warning was on so many things that it seems that there must be a lot of people who do think that, um, you could buy a, a bottle or a balloon or a high chair and go away for the weekend or something. And this uh, seemed strange to me. So I wrote this poem, Do Not Leave Baby Unattended, Manufacturer's Warning. There is a maker who refuses to be sued, a presence among us which does not wish to be believed in or leaned on or seen. He drops a small seed in the earth fruitful, dutiful, blind, and it is me, but the earth around it is also me. He names me this one's mother, and there will never be any other who could share a liability, if anything, if something. The unspeakable lodges itself like a boiling coin of blood on the tongue. Even if I die, this one is mine. My faith is a dove asleep in the slaughterhouse eaves. My attention is a net sewn of smoke and weight. Even if I died, my eyes would have to be always open underground or blinking in the sky. Whoever you are, up all night, embroidering warnings and disclaimers on our things, sleep easy, please. 
I cannot sue you. I cannot even die. Some nights are darker than trees. The sky in their hair breathes. There's no one in this house when the lights are out but the great blameless maker and the child and the mother attending these. I wrote this poem after uh, reading the uh, factoid that begins it. Sorry. They say, they say one twelfth of our lives is wasted standing in a line, the sacred path of that. Ahead of me, a man in black, his broad back. Behind me, a woman like me, unwinding her white veils. And beyond us all, the ticket taker, or the old lady with our change, or the officials with our food, our stamps, our unsigned papers, our gas masks, our inoculations. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't begun or ended. It hasn't granted us its bliss or exploded in our faces. The baby watches the ceiling from its cradle. The cat stares at the crack in the foundation. The grandfather flies the sick child's kite higher and higher. I set my husband's silverware on the table. I place a napkin besides my son's plate. Soon enough, but not tonight. Ahead of us, that man's black back. Behind us, her white veils. Ahead of us, the nakedness, the gate. Behind us, the serene errand boy, the cigarette the wink and nod, the waiting, beyond that, too late. I don't know if you know that, um, the rhyme, Solomon Grundy, you know, he lives and dies in a very morbid, sad, swift, weak, <laughs> um, horrible life and ended so soon. Uh, well, I decided that he, you know, like there wasn't enough detail about what was so, so, what had happened that was so tragic to him, so I expanded it a little. This is a, an, er, a poem early for me. Solomon Grundy. Born on Monday to mucus and blood in the arms of a teenage mother, slippery with dread, under a moon that crept with mushrooms in the dark, while the blood suckers sucked and clung to the dead, the world is as watery as a womb, he thought, gurgling and murky with tears. Baptized on Tuesday with water and weeping on a day so damp the frogs were dripping in ecstasy out of the trees. And the priest was singing, I exorcise thee. And the warm wet diaper chilled to the burning and blazing of sleet. And the Mary of misery with her bare white feet pierced his bladder with her plaster stare. And Solomon Grundy shivered and screamed. Married on Wednesday for fairer or fouler because the milk was warm in her veins and the meat was sweet on her limbs and the church bells shrieked in the steeples and the housefly slept in the feces and where they met he was bathed by the smooth white tongues of their sheets. There was peace for a while and love and she said, we have gone together now to a place from which there is no return. His pleasure uncurled at her like the mercy of sperm took ill on Thursday in the summer shade of a fever tree, and the priest screamed, I exorcise thee, and the nurse burst in with her purse full of pills and a lock of his hair and spittle and toads. They bandaged him, x-rayed him, amputated all of his watery toes, and never gave up hope until the last coin rolled from his pocket, and still on Friday he was ill. Solomon Grundy got worse on Friday, and the sun washed away in the rain, and a nun flapped past in the inky wind. His wife gave up and went home, where she slid right down into the oily mud, slick with the tongue of the neighbor's son. And Solomon Grundy, toeless and blind, listened to soap operas all afternoon, and he cried. On Saturday, Solomon Grundy died, and the priest buzzed around his corpse like a fly, and his mother picked maggots out of his eye, and his wife ripe, wiped the flower dry that wept for another between her thighs, and the slugs and the nothing clung and sucked, embalmed and gutted and buried on Sunday, and that is the end of Solomon Grundy. to myself um, not too long ago that there just isn't enough sci-fi and fantasy poetry. <laughs> so I took it upon myself to 
try to write one, but it ended up being mostly um, a list of sci-fi fantasy plots or, or things that one could do uh, use for a poem, a fantasy sci-fi poem. And I wrote this, and, um, and so that's the end of it. Uh, I won't be writing any more. Now I see why there aren't any. And, um, but I challenge you to write some fantasy sci-fi poems. But this one, in the meantime, is called Fantasy Sci-Fi. The broom closet to another planet. The impending planetary disaster. The children in their maniac trances. The rockets, the neighbors, the open-mouthed spectators. The boy tumbling into the bottomless well. There, the corn stalks, the rooster at the center of the earth, and also on Mars. Backwards, the familiar landmarks, and the plain voice which spoke your name in the middle of the night on that long drive through Nebraska. You just kept driving. What else could you do? Slow down? And your father, who made you by spilling his billion stars into the dark while crying out to your mother as the sea washed her up on the shore in the 1960s with her long hair and her vegetable recipes. And you, small package of meat and dream. And Beethoven, who lived and died deaf, music, oblivion, the kitten named Sally, alive for an hour, then dead forever. Dead forever. Nowhere the beginning, nowhere the end. Like us, her eyes never even opened. Like her, do we have any idea where we are, where we were, where we're going, even yesterday, even today? Oh, for God's sake, let us put our weapons away. This is a prose poem that um, takes its inspiration from prose, from a newspaper article, which I, none of, none of the facts have really been changed, but I did, you know, try to make it sound more musical. Um, but I'm not sure it really uh, is poetry. At, I mean, if it's poetry at all, it's only poetry, maybe in the last four lines. This is not a fairy tale. 16 years ago in northern Michigan, somewhere in the Huron National Forest, a man and a woman from a nearby town pulled over to the shoulder of the road, took their two-year-old son asleep out of the back seat, walked with him into the woods a mile or so, and set him down. It was still light enough for them to find their way back to their car. God help us, they went home. These people, drugs were involved, we suppose, some kind of profound stupidity made greater with desperation. Although it isn't possible to have sympathy for them, one still searches for some explanation. Did they sleep that night? Were they startled when the phone by the bedside rang? Well, they confessed the whole thing the next day after the child was found walking, toddling, the finder called it, along that shoulder of the road. A policeman recognized him from his own child's daycare center, and he was a smart little guy. He knew his name. This much was in the paper. Everything else you have to imagine yourself in order to survive, as he did. In order to survive it, you have to imagine it every day. When you lie down to go to sleep and when you wake. But in between, in between, your mind is full of trees. And it's quite dark despite the moon. But this summer's been a warm one. And someone tied your tiny shoes for you. Uh, this poem is called Ivan, and I just started it with my own fact, Ivan. Our rooster's name is Ivan. He rules the world. He stands on a bucket to assist the sun in its path through the sky. He will not be attending the funeral. For God has said to Ivan, you will never be sick or senile. I'll kill you with lightning or let you drown, or I'll simply send an eagle down to fetch you when you're done. So Ivan stands on a bucket and looks around. Human stupidity, the pitiful cornflakes in their bowls, the statues of their fascists, the insane division of their cells, the misinterpretations of their Bibles, their homely combs, and today, absurdly, their crisp black clothes. But Ivan keeps his thought to himself and crows. I 
wrote this poem um, after uh, I like to shop in junk shops, and I actually I have my own junk shop now. <laughs> I started a junk booth. Um, I can tell you more later if you would like to buy some junk from me. Um, but anyway, I found in this uh, junk shop this photograph album, but it was, you know, there are often photograph albums in antique stores or junk shops. But this, I mean, this was a pretty recent. I mean, these people, it seemed that way to me anyway. These photographs were mostly of people um, from the eight, 70s and 80s. And uh, there was a lot of, you know, annotating, saying who was who and what they were doing and the dates and that sort of thing. And, uh, and of course, it just begged the question, well, how, how did this end up in the junk shop? And where are the people to whom this um, would be meaningful? I didn't buy it either. It was too depressing to buy it, but I, I looked through the whole thing and then I wrote this poem, The Photograph Album in the Junk Shop. We are all the same, it claims, this forgotten couple kissing before the Christmas tree. In a year, they will be holding the Christ child between them, whose name they wish us to believe is Jim. Someone with a wheel, a girl in a purple dress, squinting, a wolf rolling in ashes, a cake bearing the Christ child's name, the waterfall at the center of every life, spewing foam and beauty onto the boats below, and also the canyon into which we'll slip. What is this on the rocks below? The whole damn picnic? And the shadow of that terrible animal with horns at every petting zoo? And the Christ child in a costume, smoking cigarettes, the poisonous brambles in bloom on a chain link fence. A fat man pretends to fly. A blonde woman laughs at a hand. The scoreboard, the lawn moan, the family cat. Here it is acceptance, here malice. And beside them all, there is grandma in a chair, staring at the future as she tells a story without moving her lips. It is a story to which the family doesn't listen because they are too busy doing what families do and because it can't be true, and still her face waits on every page like an ax left behind on the moon. Peace. The boy climbs the tree that will be his ruin and the ruin of his generation. The view from the top, too dazzling to see, the air too bright to breathe. And the box inside him in which his mother resides is velvet and black and without size. And the nation waits in a shadow. And a baby about to be born is weighted down instead with a stone. The tree, the boy, the celebrity divorce. The palace with all that blood spilled all over the marble floor. At the library again today is at the car dealership and the grocery store. No one says a word about the war. Well, I don't know if, uh, you know, many young people will never perhaps uh, experience this, and some of us are getting to the point where we don't remember it as well, but there used to be a time where people were smoking cigarettes all over the place, all the time, and that you would go into a restaurant and you would come home and you would smell like cigarettes from it for days. You had to wash your clothes, and, um, and cigarette smokers were not pariahs. They would sit right in front of you at, you know, uh, and smoke. <laughs> and uh, my parents were those people. And um, uh, they smoked a lot. And for a while, when I was in fifth grade, I went through this period where I had a chronic cough. And they took me to many doctors to see what was the matter with me. And the doc, one of the doctors said, you know, that I was obviously a nervous child. And um, so that's why I was coughing that they should buy me worry beads or something. I know I don't, I remember wanting those. I never got the worry beads. So the cough went away. But no one thought to say, um, she lives in a house, a small house with the windows closed with two chain smokers. <laughs> and that even when we would go on a bus, we always sat in the smoking section. And many of you probably don't remember or weren't alive to know about this. They used to have a smoking section on planes too. And I can remember the great relief I would have when there would be, the smoking section would be full. So we would have to sit uh, in the, and you know, all, all the drives we would take with the windows rolled up and my parents smoking in the front seat, I'd unroll it a little bit, just shut that window. What are you doing? Well, I had a cough, you know, so that's, um, that's where I got my cough. So anyway, I just was thinking about how many things have changed, and one of them is, you know, where are the cigarettes? So here's a poem about that, cigarettes. Back then, we smoked them. In every family photo, someone's smoking. 
such ashes, such sarcasm, the jokes that once made loved ones who are dead now laugh and laugh. Cigarette in hand, standing glamorously at the mantel, the fire glowing ahead and behind, and all the little glasses and the snow outside, filling up the bird baths, the open graves, the eyes, and the orchestras and gymnasiums, that mismanagement of sound, the wonderful smoke afterward in parking lots, in lungs, how homeliness was always followed by extravagance back then, like hearing lovemaking in another room or passing suffering on the side of the road without even slowing down. So it is to remember such times and to see them again so vividly in the mind, like a mysterious child traveling toward us on a moonless night, holding a jar containing a light. Thank you for being such a nice audience. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, this is called The Sweet By and By. And I, I, you know, again, it occurred to me just being here in Washington, DC, where I haven't been since I was a little kid with my parents smoking in the front seat as we toured around, um, that so many of the historical photos that I've, that I've seen of Washington, DC, you know, that's, you know, aren't, that are long, older than 50 years ago um, are in black and white. But of course, when, you know, all those people and their photo black and white photographs were here, it was probably just as dazzlingly colorful as it is now. But I think of them as having lived in black and white. Um, so anyway, this, is, uh, this poem was inspired by that. It's called The Sweet By and By. There's a place at the center of the earth where the dim rooms of our ancestors flicker their birds are there, and their crickets, the warm sand beneath their feet, a picnic, a whale washed up on the beach breathing in all the air around it, becoming solidity and dreamless sleep. But they had dumb jokes and personal identity, half-baked ideas. I've seen their magazines. They too sought pharmaceutical peace, longed for sexual release. It was not black and white, that world, despite the photographs, the amputation saws. There were individual moments, a panoply, the discovery of good luck, the invention of anxiety. But even I who bring you the news cannot begin to believe it. The lost details of their lives are also lost to me. A white sack filled with black feathers, a hole at the bottom of that sack, those black feathers drifting into an abyss of similar feathers, never, never to come back. Well, this poem is not an immortal poem. <clears throat> it will only last as long as there are people who n knew who Barney was. <clears throat> and if you don't know, no explanation is going to do you any good. <laughs> so, and if you do know, well, someday we'll be gone, and so will Barney, and no one will know what this poem, if they happen to run across it somewhere in a junk shop, they'll have no idea what I could possibly have been writing about. But those of you who know, know why my epigraph is, I love you, you love me. He is the true zero in his cap and bells, in the terrible lizard of his skin. I see him crossing the tundra in snowshoes, like a big hug coming, lost on earth in a body. Consider if I become him, what kind of suffering, this afflicted creature dancing for the hostel, costumed. Venus loves him. He loves me, has given himself to the whole world without mortification, given himself to the landscape of sap and snow and cloud, come unto the world and made it pregnant, singing to the invisible family before him, swallowing the sorrow of children, innocent, curious, extinct. A narrow stream of tears runs right through him. When the beloved is in everyone and the excited imbecile, the timid orgy of sleep, who can help but think of Christ with his sandals and lambs? Why all of us? Why not just some? Oh, the emptiness of so much, the everlastingness, this hug, quivering, endured, a purple balloon like our hearts, naked and blown up, without flesh, wrinkles, fur. It loves without an object of it, and how we long to keep the beast of it stuffed down inside us, along with the little saints and fools, who sing pitiful songs in our chests.
door. Broken door this morning, banging in the wind, like someone who slammed it once and stomped away and wanted to be let back in. Memory and longing, but not this morning. Not this morning, as I lie unburdened in the creeping sun and think, thank God, my father's two years ashes and my mother so long and safely dead and gone. All over, all over, their embryonic unfolding, the slow brass clock on their mantle, the peaches they like to savor in summer, and our family jokes, our secret passwords, their hopeful faces, their corn on the cob, and their paper plates. Thank God, thank God, buried, burnt, forgotten, where nothing else can harm them. This is called May Morning, and I wrote it after a visit to the cancer center at um, our university hospital, which is the, the cancer center and the hospital too, but particularly the cancer center is just this enormous gleaming sort of <clears throat> spaceship of a building and just sort of this incredible and wonderful cathedral to healing but also to you know to illness and um, I had it I had an encounter um, there and that's what inspired the poem May morning the thoughts of the schoolgirl dragging her backpack across the grass the thoughts of the sleepwalker and the trash man and the flower tender and the teenage couple at the mall. Like I have been handed them all, like I have heard their music, as if the saints, the way the lilacs that day, as if a glass box of it, like a vial of perfume poured all over the whole creation, perfume extracted from the sky, like no grammar, no makeup, no time behind my blindfold. When the hospitalized child stopped me in the hallway and told me his name, Sebastian, his little white gown, his tiny smile, blindfold yanked off after thousands of years. Who needed eyes? <clears throat> My son um, went through a period of being, uh, I'm sorry, so obsessed with the Civil War that I had friends. Um, and relatives who thought, who actually suggested um, kind of seriously, alarmingly seriously, that perhaps he had um, been reincarnated. <laughs> because, and it still was a little creepy. He knew, he retained the information about the Civil War and knew the names of generals that, you know, have long since been forgotten. And it, but I don't think that was the case. Um, but anyway, he was so into it. And being an only child, um, he, you know, got to go to Gettysburg because, you know, he, he wanted to go. He was obsessed with Gettysburg, so we took him there. And um, I wrote this poem at Gettysburg, and uh, I guess it's a little bit about our, our different attitudes toward the place, um, as well as being about my inability to read a map, which has stayed with me forever, at Gettysburg. The one I love stands at the edge of a wheat field, wearing a blue cap, holding a plastic musket in his hand. The one I love does a goofy dance at Devil's Den, mans a cannon, waves at me from a hill. He dips his foot into bloody run. The sepia dream of his dead body is pulled by the water over the rocks, and I am the shadow of a stranger taking his picture, laid out like so much black drapery on the pavement. Is there some better explanation? Was there some other mossy, meandering path we might have taken to this place through time and space? Why is it that where my heart should be, there's a small, bright horse instead? While I was simply standing over there by a stone, waiting, did an old woman run her bony hand through my hair and leave this gray ribbon there? The one I le love leans up against a fence and then pretends to be shot. He opens his eyes wide and grabs his chest, stumbles backwards, falls gracefully into the grass, where he lies for a long time holding the sun in his arms. I take another picture there. The worms beneath him make the burden of the earth seem light enough to bear. And still inside me, I believe I carry the pond where the injured swans have come to flock. I believe I hold inside me the lake into which the beautiful, armless mortals wish to wade. I am, after all, their executioner and their creator, being as I am their mother. 
Were they gods who came to earth to die and suffer, I wonder, or boys who died and turned to gods? Oh, the one I love needs sunblock, I think, too late, and perhaps a bottle of water. But now I have no idea where we are. Where were you, God asks, when I spread out the heavens and the earth? If you were not there then, how can you expect to know where you are now? Truly, I don't know. I look around. I say, we're lost to the one I love, who looks over my shoulder and laughs. No, Mom, he says, and points to the dot and arrow of ourselves on the map. You're holding the battlefield upside down. This is called comedy. It's a fine day, except for the doll someone hanged from the overpass. We've all slowed down to gawk at its awful nakedness, its little black shoe, floppy bonnet, rope tied around its neck. If the cops don't get here soon, someone will have an accident, someone will have a heart attack, someone will get sued. Everyone's a comedian, the teenage boys somewhere shoving a mannequin off a roof the medical students in a morgue goofing around with a corpse. Just a simple, bad, practical joke. The sun's rays, luminous alleys and passageways leading to little dark places. The heart, that industrial center. The mind, that tower with a sniper. How much we hate each other is apparent in the laughter, but something else in the breaking and the gasping. This comedy, like a cat staring aghast at a parrot, Jesus Christ, it thinks, flightless bird that speaks the language of the master. And I'm uh, just going to read one more poem. Assuming I can find the right place for it. Um, so I started the reading with this uh, sort of charm to to my son. I'm going to end with this little blessing, uh, I guess it is. I wrote it this fairly soon after um, September 11th, the first September 11th. Um, and uh, it is about McDonald's a little bit, uh, especially Happy Meals. I heard that they were going to maybe take the toys out of the Happy Meal. Well, my son, I tried really hard to, um, well, I mean, a lot of things went by the wayside after I had a kid. Because I, I used to think before he was born that I would, like my own child, would never eat refined sugar or flour. And then um, after about six months, I would, like, you know, here, would you like a bottle full of root beer? <laughs> Will that make you be quiet? <laughs> so that all went out there. I also, but I did try to, you know, cover up the Happy Meal um, situation that he wouldn't find out that he could get toys uh, by for eating junk food. Um, but somehow he found out. I mean, I just think it's in the water or something. They they have this way of knowing. So it's about that. But it's also about at the end. I mean, at the, the poem I read uh, before that was about. Um, you know, hoping, keeping an eye on him and making sure everything will be good for him. And then at the end of this one, I think it's more about, well, uh, mostly hoping that when I'm gone, he's just fine. You know, like, I'm not here to watch anymore. Be happy. I think I can speak for all our mothers and every uh, all mothers at uh, all times, if I might be so bold and say, that's what they all want, right? That's what we all want is just, uh, you know, yeah. Don't cry too hard when we're dead. Go and have a good time. Pretend, you know, that, that uh, we never existed because that's the whole point. Except my, not for my husband. My husband needs to be deeply grieved and never remarry. But my son needs to move on with his life and uh, not think about me. That would make me a happy dead mom. Happy meal for Jack. At the bottom of the bag, there is a fact, a bit of joy, a bit of junk, which my son was issued from the womb into this world knowing. All those years, the way we lived, so much gardening in the dark, or an old blind woman sewing a tremulous rose on a tablecloth. Have a great night, the boy at the second drive through window says. He smiles like a boy who woke only moments ago to the sound of a moth in a city made of linen. Autumn already, and the sh showy flowers are over, retreated into the earth. It simply means what it is, neither beginning nor fin de siècle, regardless of the way it feels. Unlike the child in the car seat behind me, I'm old enough to remember when the television used to sign off, 
the star-spangled banner and a flag in the wind, followed by nothing but fuzz. How many nights I woke to that fuzz, a girl in the center of a dress made of electrical dust. For years, I watched the news, and still I saw this world as through a shower door, steamily, and taught my child to speak of the griefs of the past in silly words and song. Boo-boo, ashes, we all fall down. But once a father bolted his doors and said to his family, we must allow our friends and neighbors to call on us no more. It is a little monster, this fact, at the bottom of the bag, this complimentary toy. And to the child behind me, it seems completely free, despite the price. Oh, happy meal, even happier, the happiest meal of our lives. No end of the world, no horizon on fire, and a blessing before I forget. May some beautiful evening in the future find you sipping wine with your beloved in a peaceful foreign country while the lake moves full of shredded moon and tiny candlelit fish and the sound of a violin played expertly in another room and my death, if it has come, not troubling you a bit. Thank you so much for listening. And if anyone is interested in answering, or if you would answer the questions, that would be even better than asking them. <laughs> but if anybody would like to ask any questions, I would try to answer qu any questions that you might have. Yes, uh-huh. I'm sorry, I can't. A favorite bookstore? Book sale chain. I don't, I guess I don't really know what that means. Well, in Ann Arbor, although we're a wonderful college town, we've simply run out of any bookstores. Borders started there and Borders is gone. So if I want to go to a bookstore in Ann Arbor, I either go to a used bookstore or Barnes & Noble. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. So um, I noticed that you have a lot of poems about your son, and obviously that's probably shifted from when you started writing poetry to now. So how have you seen your writing change over the years? I guess I'm trying to ask. Right. I think um, I write a po lot of poems that aren't about my son as well because I don't, wouldn't want to embarrass him <laughs> in thinking that uh, he's my, or to flatter him, thinking he's my only subject matter. Um, I, th I think some of them are the poems that I like to read the most just because I feel affection for them. But certainly when I, um, before I had my son, I mean, well, in, in general, my writing, is always, you know, when I sit down to write a poem, it's inspired by a line or, you know, some little bit of music or an image. And then the poem kind of, you know, grows around that. I, I pretty much when I write, I, you know, I'm writing longhand and I'm not really thinking of it as a poem. So it just goes wherever, wherever it goes. But so always, you know, it's, you know, my daily concerns. And, um, you know, I'm a pretty, even before I, you know, had a child or anything, I think, the domestic world was has always been sort of what I've been most involved in. Yes. Uh, what I'm interested in, you know, when I read your work is you have a lot of repetitions and unusually shaped blocks of text and a lot of space. How, was that kind of natural to you when you started writing, or was this something that somewhat developed, kind of? Well, I mean, I, th I think it's both. I mean, it, I think the reason it developed is because it just started to feel more natural. At some point, um, it's several years ago, I, I did, I mean, I consciously decided I wanted to write some prose poetry because I felt, I mean, just, you know, maybe it's silly, but I... I wanted, I felt that it would give me an excuse to do the things that I was doing otherwise, which is to get pretty showy with the language or, you know, not, you know, sort of elaborate or ornate or, and it seemed like in my poems, especially broken into lines, that was getting a little over the top and that maybe I should do something to rein it in a little bit. So, I mean, at the first part, I thought, well, I'll write prose poems because then maybe it'll t teach me 
to be, you know, a little more precise and not do all the repetition all the time and that sort of thing. But then it kind of had the opposite effect, I think, where I thought, well, you know, since this is a prose poem, I can really, you know, I can just go full tilt with the alliteration and the rhyme because I'm not, you know, as I'm not calling as much attention to it. So I think that, you know, um, I would assume it's the same with most writers and particularly poets experimenting with line breaks and that sort of thing. It really is, you know, there's just, I mean, you write for a period of time and I don't know, there's, there does become like a kind of music in your head or something that you're, that you're listening to. And I, I do like to think of the, you know, what a poem looks like on the page as kind of a score for how the reader would read it and hear what I'm trying to do. So, you know, I, I'd say like only about 10% of what I'm doing with those lines is that conscious or even comes out in revision, but just as more the way I hear it when I'm, you know, translating it from my head onto the page. Thank you. Yes. How do you get into that fugue state? Yeah, she uh, basically asking about inspiration. How do you get into a fugue state <laughs> to get there? Um, it's really hard. I think that's why I write prose as well, because, you know, a novel, you cannot be in a fugue state for the three, four, five years it takes <laughs> to write a novel. You have to be able to, you know, after you've um, had a long day, you, to turn on the computer and sit down and work on a paragraph rather than to be in some sort of, you know, mental state where you are, you know, highly inspired. Um, I, you know, part of it is reading, but a lot of times it's just something that hopefully once in a while happens, you know, it's just, it's not something that I can really induce. It's also, um, you, with poetry, writing poetry is a little, you know, I do feel like I have to show up every day, as writers say, you know, in order for the muse to maybe be there. But, you know, the, usually it, the muse is pretty more work a day than that. <laughs> and so it's only once in a while, actually, in the, in the um, actual act of writing that that occurs to me. So I guess that that's my answer to the question, to make a long story even longer. Um, I while I'm writing, that either occurs or it doesn't occur. But it's, you know, nothing I can do beforehand. Well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to be here. The dog doesn't like clapping. <laughs> but I do, thank you. <laughs> This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.